with myself and if I won that battle the rest was was pretty easy it's about having a bit of mongrel in you you've got to be aggressive nobody wants fast bowlers bowling half volleys getting hit for four and skipping around smiling that's my idea of the perfect quick My main two strengths were accuracy and a little bit of bounce and just self-belief. I don't think anyone came close to believing in their own ability as much as Glenn McGrath. He had this fierce determination about him, this focus. And when I played with him, you, you came to learn that he loved bowling. You walk across that boundary line, he was fierce. This is a really, really green wicket, McGrath. Boom, this is your day. Great stamina and great heart. He just kept bowling and bowling and bowling and bowling. He just kept at you and at you and at you. He did it over and over and over again. Metronomic accuracy. Impeccable line and length. Unrelenting patience. Consistency. Repeatability of method. As a bowler, a great bowler. He's got to be one of the best that's ever played the game. I grew up outside of a small country town, basically in the middle of New South Wales, on a sheep and wheat farm. I think it instills a, a certain work ethic from a young age. By the time we were seven, we were, we were driving the car to you know, 5k down the road to the bus stop and leave it in the neighbour's place. You'd come home, you'd work on the tractor. You know, it's just a different mentality in the bush. You have to be a little bit more self-sufficient. That freedom, as well as that work ethic, I think was perfect and I wouldn't change anything about my childhood. I was very sport orientated, but cricket was always sort of my main passion. I think if you ask me back then what I wanted to do was to, to play cricket for Australia and as a fast bowler. He had all the gifts, all the talents in the world. He didn't stand out as an outstanding junior. I didn't get that many opportunities. I didn't play any underage representative stuff. Uh, a few people in Narromine thought I wasn't good enough for local cricket, but I played my first representative game when I was 17. So in that respect, I think I was a little bit of a late starter. He wasn't actually spotted until he was playing as a 19-year-old the game for Dubbo against Parks, and I think he's picked out by Doug Walters, who says, you know, there's a little bit about this bloke. We played uh, probably up to a dozen of those games in country areas, and we found a, a lot of guys and gave the opportunity to a lot of guys. It was played on a, a footy field, a, a rugby league field, and there was no cricket wicket, so they just rolled out an aluminium strip with synthetic grass on it and pinned it down. It was a little bit dicey, the aluminium wicket, but I could see that he had more than just normal ability. He had great balance, great structure, and he was a, a good human being. And he gave it to a couple of old suckers, which was very exciting because I wasn't one of them. <laughs> the guys that played in that game felt I had a little bit of potential. There was a lot of chat, a lot of bluing in the change rooms about <laughs> You come and play for me, you come and play for me. I'm like, wow, they love this guy. It was after that game that Sutherland District Cricket Club invited me to move down to Sydney. I thought, I'm ready for a change, why not? So 19 years of age, I, I moved to Sydney. Anyone from the country struggles at first. Uh, when they first come to the city, it's a, it's a big change to your lifestyle. But uh, in, in Glenn's case, it was more about getting settled into the area. We didn't know anyone in Sydney, so my mum and I decided we'd buy a caravan and tow that to Sydney. And I lived in a caravan by myself for the first 13 months I was in Sydney. I remember playing him when I was playing for Banks and he was playing for Sutherland. Skinny kid from Narromine, I think his, his pants were halfway over his leg. I mean, he had the wrong 
size pants on, he had these long, big shoes. Um, he just looked very gangly and awkward. People started to look at this young, sp spindly kid that was actually cleaning up top line players like the War Boys. He's, there was something special about it. The more he grew, the stronger he got, the better he got. To go down there and live, eat, breathe cricket 24 7, it showed me what you needed to do if you wanted to be successful playing first class or international cricket. And I think that was a big learning curve for me. It had an inevitability about it really that he was going to eventually play for New South Wales. Glenn McGrath first represented his state in January 1993. By the end of the year, he had established himself as an emerging talent in the game. But it was a confrontation against Australian captain Alan Border that would propel him to the next level. The first time that I played against him uh, was New South Wales versus Queensland. Both teams were at full strength, and uh, AB was uh, taught me what uh, having a chat on the field was all about. He was a good bowl in those days, but raw um, and straight out of the bush. But. Um, yeah, I gave him a hard time, I must admit, when I was batting against him. He was like really narky that particular game as well, so it was a baptism of fire for McGrath. It was Jethro, you know, big country oaky. He must have bought the white pants when he was five foot four, and, th and all of a sudden he'd grown to six foot five. He's wearing a pair of white trousers, which barely covered his calf. So AB said to him, mate, this is first class cricket, invite your trousers down for the party. So he kept having a go at me about when, when's the flood coming and you know do I speak and all this and it was it was it was yeah I loved it. McGrath, you just never talk to him, you know, because he just loves the battle, loves the competition, and you know even to the great of and greatness of an Allen Border that was like a red rag to the ball to McGrath. You can almost hear him going, mate, I don't care about you know what you've done for the game. This is going to be my day. Next over, wide one, slash, court. That showed me what first class and international cricket was going to be all about. Even though I was giving him a hard time, he just thought, you know, there's something about this bloke, you know, tall, gangly. Um, but there was a bit of mongrel about him. I put my arm around him and I said, I'm really filthy, Glenn. He said, what's up? I said, I'm not going to play a lot of cricket with you. He said, oh. Why is that? He took five for 63, I think. I said, because you're going to play a lot of cricket for Australia, brother. He is actually the kind of bowler that perhaps Australia is looking for. Because if you recall in the early 1990s, Australia had had a pretty good fast bowling attack, but they were coming to the end of their natural lifespan. And before I knew it, I'm uh, over in Perth getting ready to play my first test match. It all happened so quickly that I don't think it really had sunk in until I played a couple of test matches and then I was away. That's his first test wicket. He pretty much learnt most of his cricket playing for Australia. So the first year, 18 months, he was pretty, pretty green. He developed very quickly from that raw talent that I saw first up. It probably only took him two years for him to start to really blossom into a, an unbelievable test cricketer. That 95 tour to the West Indies was a big tour for the Australian team. Craig McDermott and Damien Fleming, who were the two uh, main bowlers for Australia at that time, both in front of me, uh, both got injured. All of a sudden, Mark Taylor said to him, well, you've got to leave the attack now. And he said, well, what have you been waiting for? The team plan was to bowl aggressively because they'd been an incredible team for the previous you know, 15, 20 years or more. And that was a directive from the senior guys who had had enough. We want to go at them hard, show them that we mean business. He took it up and he was good enough to do it and it was the making of him, no doubt about it. I think that sort of unsettled them. We ended up winning that series and the Australian team went to number one in the world and stayed there for a long time. On, gone, middle stump. Pidge used to just have that ability to be able to just produce something from ball one. No how you going, mate. We get used to the day. You just were on and it was tough. Really, really tough. There's not that fear factor, the pace factor, but there's just the fear of this is going to be so hard and no one likes to get out of bed, no one. You got a really hard day's work in front of you. 
It's actually a little bit hard to remember what cricket was like before Glenn McGrath. He's almost as revolutionary a bowler as Dennis Lilly was in the 1970s, if in a much less dramatic fashion. And that's got to be very close. Yes, that's the finish. Glenn McGrath has done it in style. By 97, he was an unbelievably good international bowler. It was my first real trip to the UK to go over there and you know, growing up in the bush, staying up through the night, watching the Ashes Test matches over in, in the UK was what it was all about. They won that first Test match after winning the, the One Day Series as well. And I remember looking over at the English celebrating on their balcony and I hated every minute of it. We went off to Lords, and Lords is an amazing place. The history, the tradition. I think everyone lifts when they go to, to Lords. The ball was coming out exactly where I wanted it. I was lucky enough to watch him for many years and see how he operates, and it didn't vary too much from that modus operandi. It was very simple, yet incredibly effective. I think that wicket was tailor made for my style of bowling. A bit of a slant in the wicket, and I walked off with 8 for 38 after the first innings. And, yeah, feeling pretty good. I often tell people that myself and Glenn McGrath bowled England out on the first day for 70 odd. I got two and McGrath chipped in with eight. It was a great effort from Glenn to support me in that time. 36 wickets and relentless spells of controlled fast bowling helped Australia to a 3 2 Ashes win. Glenn McGrath was quickly becoming the most consistent bowler in Test cricket. He'd joke around and say, Look, Dizzy, I can't swing it, I can't seam it, but I know I can land the ball on that spot 95 times out of 100, so I'm going to take wickets. I can't re ever remember Glenn really having a bad series. He was such a consistent bowler. Anything in that pitch whatsoever, Glenn McGrath was definitely good enough to exploit, and that just made him the best. Well, that's got to be pretty close. Yes, it's all over, and Australia have retained the Ashes once again. It wasn't just how McGraw was getting batsmen out. Go for him! He's getting him out! It was who he was getting out. Oh, beautifully bowled, he's gone. Farrell doesn't even bother to look at umpire here, and that's a reward for some magnificent bowling. He was great at uh, analysing the opposition batsmen. He just he could be probed for that weakness, and he could see him working a batsman over. And I rarely, if ever, saw a batsman get on top of him. As a fast bowler, to come up against the best batsman in the world, you've got the opportunity to see how good you are. And I used to, I loved that challenge. It was almost like a wanted list in the old Cowboys. It was like, <laughs> he'd pin it up in the change room. McGrath was always going on about how he'd knock over Lara. No, don't worry about discussing him in the team meeting, I've got him. <laughs> McGrath took the great West Indian Brian Lara's wicket 15 times. But few were more special than in the second test between Australia and the West Indies in December 2000. I was doing an interview before the match, and they said, you know, you're sitting on 298 wickets. You know, have you been thinking about the 300? I said, oh, the perfect scenario would be to get Sherwin Campbell out for my 299th, and then Brian Lara for my 300th. I got Sherwin Campbell edged, Ricky Ponting caught it first slip, and then first ball to Brian Lara just sort of pitched around about middle league went across him, he edged it to Stu McGill and brought up my 300. So to say how I'd like it to turn out, and it turned out, was, uh, was pretty amazing. But then the next ball to Jimmy Adams to bowl it into his ribs and he'd pop up an easy catch for Justin Langer in close for the hat-trick is something you just dream of. So that was pretty special. Batsman just got worn down. Ask Michael Atherton. I think he was one of the big bunnies of McGrath Athers. He got me out so often and so quickly. If there's anything in the pitch, he'd find it. If there's any little error or glitch in your technique, he would find it. It was a simple case of that off stump, fourth stump line, and eventually Athers would have a little nibble at it. I half felt sorry for Athers the last time I got him out, and it was his final game. I wasn't bowling that well, it wasn't that quick, and the ball was doing nothing. Athers kept playing and missing, and I thought, I'll just try to bowl one a little bit straighter and see what happens. And so I bowled one a bit straighter, and Athers just nicked it straight to warning at first slip. For a quality batsman like that, it probably shouldn't be that easy. I'm not, I don't mean to have a go at Athers there. I'm not sledging or anything, but I think at that stage, Athers was a bit of a shot duck, and that was the only time I half felt sorry for a batsman. 
the only time you really knew you were on top of him was when he was losing the plot a little bit and shouting and uh, and having a go at people yourself or something. That that's okay. I quite enjoyed that. A lot of his words, in a sense, even though they seem to be directed towards a batsman or, or someone else were more or less directed at himself. I set the bar very high for myself and if I didn't uh, reach it or succeed it or deliver the exact ball I wanted, then I was pretty dirty of myself and I think I gave myself as hard a time as I ever gave a batsman. I've only had one bad uh, experience with him in Antigua, but I mean, apart from that, I don't really take it on. As, I mean, it, it comes with the territory. I remember the blow up with Sarwan. Sarwan made a very innocent comment, but he used the word wife. McGrath's just snapped, you know, and it was really sad that he had to do that in the public domain. There were underlying reasons behind that incident in Antigua. McGrath's wife Jane had been diagnosed with breast cancer in 1997, and the disease began to worsen in 2003 as Australia toured the West Indies. I can't imagine what it would have been like to be on tour and in his shoes when he'd go back to his room by himself and then probably be on the phone to Jane and talking with her, and, but then still be alone. But next morning, you'd often ask, everybody ask Glenn, you know, like, you know, how's Jane, how are things going? And almost standard response, never better, I'm never better. And he was always never better. Oh, never been better, never been better, he'd say. And, you know, that's how he felt. I've never known anyone in my life that is so positive. Let's not forget also Jane's role in that as well. The two actually ran off each other in this great footprint of positivity, which wasn't a facade, it's just McGrath. If I was playing cricket, it meant everything was fine. If I was at home when, the, when Australia was playing, it meant something was wrong. It was a way, I guess, to escape a little bit as well. I could really focus on what I was doing there. Sometimes that's the best place to go, is to go and play cricket, and that's what you really love doing. I was there because I wanted to be there. Um, what Jane was going through and what we're going through off the field is real life. And McGrath was still the world's finest fast bowler. In 2004, he produced career best figures against Pakistan in Perth. I don't know if you call it a sixth sense or something else, but I just knew something special was going to happen that day when I woke up in the morning. And that morning, I just, I don't know, it was just a, an incredible feeling. My goal was always to bowl the perfect game. And that game there uh, was, was one of the closest I got. It was just one of those days where everything I tried worked. Edges were flying everywhere, guys were taking catches. I finished with eight for 24 and uh, yeah, probably up there with the best I've ever bowled, or well, the best I've felt bowling. McGrath's ability on the cricket field, however, was restricted to his prowess with the ball. As a batsman, he cut a far less accomplished figure. As hopeless as McGrath was with the bat, it always used to baffle me how he'd come in the change rooms and be just vomiting at the decision and vomiting how unlucky he was and said, mate, you cannot bat. Why are you disappointed? And I was think, how could you get out like that? And it was like probably a mixture of embarrassment and being annoyed. You know, I expected so much more of myself. Steve Wall was his coach, and they had a lot of fights too when they were coaching him. He would say he had potential. I always said he was um, a natural left-hander, but he never worked it out. I think when Stephen gave up, I actually started scoring some runs. <laughs> to get a test 50, which was quite miraculous in its own way. Well, and he's done it, and he's done it in grand style with a boundary. Well done, Glenn McGrath, first ever half century in test cricket. I guess it's something you always dream of, to see my teammates' faces in the replays is something quite amazing. The good thing about his batting was that he sent out a message to the opposition that they knew he wasn't a good batsman, uh, but he never backed away, and that, for us, gave us almost a strength in a way that um, our worst player was not going to back down no matter what. McGrath was also now closing in on becoming the second fast bowler to take 500 test match wickets. He would get his chance against England in the 2005 Ashes. 
the minimum goal I wanted to achieve was 500 test wickets. But then to do it at the home of cricket at Lords, you know, you couldn't ask for a better script or for it to have worked out any better. We're not going to see too many fast bowlers break 400, let alone 500. Nine wickets in the game, and it seemed like McGrath was leading Australia to Ashes victory once again until he stepped on a ball in the second test warm-up. We played well in that first test match. I bowled well, I was feeling good. I was lucky enough to get man of the match in that test match and then to step on the ball an hour or so before the game started it was terrible. It was like a cartoon. I saw him stepping back and it was almost like, no, we wanted to grab him and just bring back, rewind time. Amazing how quickly you can come crashing back down. <laughs> I went off to, had scans at the hospital. As soon as I arrived back at the ground, they announced over the PA system that I was out and a big cheer went up around the ground. And that sort of shifted, the whole momentum of the series shifted at that moment when McGrath stepped on the ball and we couldn't wrestle it back. McGrath doesn't stand on that ball and we win the Ashes probably 5-0. I'm sure that incident was a huge part of England winning that series. A year later, McGrath was back and facing England again. Having lost hold of the Ashes for the first time in 16 years, Australia wanted revenge. Out of every team in the world, I hated England beating us. <laughs> we loved beating England, and he, lo he loved telling them what they were going to win by. He'd always get asked by the journalists, you know, pre an Ashes series, what's your prediction? And he'd always say 5 0. Him being McGrath just kept going with it. Being Muhammad Ali of the fast bowling world, you know, came up with the big predictions and we go, oh, McGrath, you're an idiot. And he goes, oh, what? What am I meant to say? Well, we're going to lose a test. McGrath justified that self confidence with six wickets in the first innings of the first test. Australia's veteran bowler ripped through the English batting lineup and silenced the suggestions that he was past his prime. They were calling us Dad's Army because everyone was so old. I was. Was I, I was 36 going on 37. I just took my sixth wicket walking off. I thought the boys would clutch me off and said, so I have a bit of fun. I just clutched my back and sort of hobbled off, pretending to be a bit of an old bloke. If someone wants to put him down or, or uh, doubt his ability or think he's finished, then I think he thrives on that and, and he wants to prove people wrong. We had two, two days before heading to Adelaide for the second test. And I remember going to bed one night, still very focused on what I wanted to achieve, which was a thousand international wickets, so tests and one days combined. And just woke up the next morning, and all of a sudden that wasn't important to me anymore. On the 23rd of December 2006, Glenn McGrath announced his retirement. But he continued to roll back the years for the remainder of the Ashes series. His 21 wickets proved decisive in realising his prediction of a 5 0 win including a fitting farewell at his home ground in Sydney. If you ask me what, how I'd like to finish, or if I could have one thing that final day, it would be to take a wicket on my last ball. I remember it clearly, it was a slower ball with Jimmy Anderson. He just scooped it up. And Mike Hussey, who was fielding it mid-on, took a pretty easy catch. I think I would have been booed for years if I hadn't dropped that one, it was a pretty easy catch. <laughs> I thought, my test career is finished. I finished with the wicket off my last ball. You know, can't get any better than this. I nearly drew a tear, I have to say. It was special. Remembering his whole career from the days here at, you know, Carringbar Oval through to the SCG with New South Wales, through to the Australian side, all the way through, and to see him eventually say, you know what, I've had enough. It was the end of a very, very good career that you have to sit back and say, wow, that was just something special. You know, I achieved everything I wanted to achieve in world cricket, plus more. So I'm, you know, I was happy to walk away and, uh, yeah, some great memories. A year after retirement, however, Glenn's wife Jane lost her battle with breast cancer. She had been ill with the disease for 10 of his 14 years as a test cricketer. Going through stuff like that puts life in perspective. You realise what's important. And the most important things in life are the people around you, your family, your friends. And I've been very lucky with the people I've had in my life. That's why the McGrath Foundation now, after Jane's passing, just goes from strength to strength. Because it's not only a great McGrath story, but it's a fantastic Australian story. And now it's a fantastic global story. I think it's an incredible legacy for my family and especially for my children, but also for other families around Australia going through breast cancer. To see that support 
and people getting behind a cause that's very close to my heart. It just blows me away. Glenn McGrath's story is the quintessential Australian tale. The boy from the bush who made it in the big league. 563 test wickets, more than any other fast bowler in history. A symbol of his country's consistency and dominance. A true Australian hero. The commitment that it would have had to take to come up from the country to play club cricket in the Shire of Sutherland and live in a caravan and take all that risk, unbelievable. As a fast bowler, for him to keep doing it over and over again, you know, it was a great achievement. To have done something I had a real love, real passion for, get paid for doing it as well, travel the world, I couldn't ask for more. But I still have to pinch myself to think that I was lucky enough to play for Australia. Thank you.